So we're about to start a 100 meter transect as we continue up the western side of San Juan Simo. And we keep the lasers on and try and keep a steady distance from the bottom. That'll allow quantification of the organisms that live here. And we try and do about five of these transects uh, per dive. And we can see potentially the change in the community structure as we go up the slope. And we're heading into a lower oxygen region now should have an effect on the kind of creatures that we see. There's a question in the chat. Uh, Kira is asking us, was taking two rocks at one location for replicate purposes? All right, stepping forward. Uh, Roger, that no. this will be the start of transfer here. Thank you. Just an opportunity to, Thank you. to get a couple of rocks while we were in a good spot to do it. I'll have a piece. Thank you. Jake, can you stop Argus from heaving, please? <laughs> yeah, I'll do active heave compensation. Yeah, active heave. <laughs> yeah. Manual active heave compensation. That's the way. Mm. I wouldn't say no. I'd be very impressed if that. <laughs> yeah, if you get it wrong, <laughs> that sine wave will be pretty. Yeah. <laughs> We're starting to plateau a little here. What's that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, the sonars look uh, pretty, pretty flat. Not just our bathy. Going over some of those sea urchins that we were seeing before. Are those the ones that call pincushion sea urchins? Or is that a different species? I didn't quite hear that. Are those the ones that they call uh, pincushion sea urchins? Or yeah, they're they? actually quite soft. Mm. I'm hoping we will collect one at some point today. Just blanking on the name, I'll, I'll look it up. So, Kira, I don't know if you're if you're listening, but any explanation for the way these rocks are pitted and eroded? I find it pretty remarkable that some rocks have sediment all over them, but then you'll see these starkly black little boulders, smooth and clearly different in some way. Mm. Yeah, so we're interested in, in that too. Like what do different microbes colonize the surfaces of different types of rocks? And does the mineral composition affect that? Could 
you had a runaway Doppler beam. Yeah. We were experiencing that in those Forea fields. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's right. Lost Doppler, so. Of course, it was when Jake and I were flying. <laughs> up some more sediment on this plateau if we get to a up to this transect if maybe we get lucky and there's a place we could even do some coring. Mm. Quick gauge check. Sure thing. Thanks, Jake. So for the colonization experiments, um, <clears throat> we'll be deploying those when the oxygen levels are correct in the water. Is that my understanding? Yeah, we'll try and get uh, quite a bit shallower, but if we need to make space to collect things, we will put them out. So we'll, we'll delay it as long as possible. Roger that. Do we still have open space in the toolbox? I believe yep. there was two rocks for the colonization experiment, so. We have forward space. One, one we, have colon we have blocks of wood in the uh, starboard box that we need to get rid of before we can put anything in there. Roger that. So to all of our viewers right now, the light that you're seeing is can just you from the RO. From the oh, yes, we can hear you, Lisa. I must have muted something. We can hear you. Very loud. So the light that we're seeing right now is just from the ROV and we're at about 950 meters deep, which is just shy of where the last little bit of sunlight can, pen can penetrate to, which is 1000 meters. Can it really get that deep? I always thought it was like 200. Depends where you are. So the turbidity of the water, is that what, you're, what you yeah, mean by that? If you're off La Jolla, you'll be in pitch dark at uh, 20 meters most of the year. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but in the middle of the Pacific, mm -hmm. uh, you can... I've been in a submersible 500 meters down and we can still see a little bit of light. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's very... There's a whole areas of reefs tropical Pacific with very clear water that you can still have algae growing down at 100 meters. Exactly. 200. Uh, 200 meters. Wow. So they're called mesophotic reefs. Mm. Mm. Yeah. One of the deepest known seaweeds was collected with a, a manned submersible. 
the Johnson Sea Link submersible. And they named it Johnson Sea Linkia. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Oh, there's a some, ray, some type of yeah. ray up to the left. Escape. Wow, look how the oxygen dropped. So interesting. I see a rockfish. Another one of those really long spine sea urchins. That's the big difference from yesterday's dive. There were tons of rockfish yesterday. Very few today. See one or two scattered. Add one more step, five zero meters, one two zero. Yeah, Roger. Bridge now. Change speed to 0 0.3. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> when I first called him in, I said 0.3, and he said 0.3, but I think it's because of our high wind and high current that it's being, it's been not quite 0.3. I don't think it overshoots. And then this last one was at 0.2, so. Roger. Thanks, Ernie. See what happens there. You have an estimate of the current speed here? Uh, Down on the seafloor or up on the On the seafloor. Sea uh, it's not really blowing that hard. Yeah. Um, we can probably, once we're done with this transect, we can let ourselves sail in it for a second and see how fast we go. Um, but it, it's not really blowing that hard right now. barren up here mm. Mm. yeah we're on a very uh, very flat area right now before it'll start to slope up again so we've got a long straight straight flat straight flat area ahead of us now before we begin to rise again uh, we were hoping we might be able to do some push coring yeah i'd be curious to see how deep these sediments are if they're deep at all yeah we can try next time we settle down but i'd say it's probably pretty shallow yeah, it looks pretty shallow. And pretty sandy. Yeah. We can even poke it with a manip, but I don't think that core will go very far. guys mind if I do a zoom in on Argus? Argus, go ahead. I'm still really curious about all these circular pits in these rocks. one of the large yellow sponges we sampled recently, Staurocalyptus. It's a glass sponge. Beautiful yellow vase. And then the feathery things we're seeing scattered around are, uh, there's one on the right of the field right now, that's a filter feeding sea cucumber that attaches permanently to rocks. 
And so we have another kind of sponge that on the left that we sampled earlier as well, called Ferrea. Beautiful, very delicate glass sponge. Some quite interesting sediment right here with a big burrow. Ooh, a couple ooh, of big burrows in that, the mud. Yeah. Interesting. Um, Who do you think lives in there? Good question. No idea. It's be quite large. Tile fish. So, Greg, take a look at the oxygen. It's really dropped. Yeah, the oxygen's suddenly dropping. We're, we're really pretty flat. How much longer on the transect? Oh, just another 15 meters. Did you want to... Did I? I didn't hear that. Sorry. You said 15 meters? 15 meters. 15 meters. This, yeah. this sediment's looking a little thicker. Yeah. Yeah. Let's see where that burrow thing, mm. the hole was. Yeah. So are you looking for anything particular other than low oxygen to put out the condensation? No, uh, we'll put them out on a rock somewhere. Um, somewhere kind of visible gives us the best chance of finding it again. Is that why you want to put them on a rock face and not the sediment? You don't want them getting covered? Oh, it would be unlikely to be covered in the year that they're down. Um, but uh, somewhere prominent, they can be very hard to find, even if you're 10 meters off with, it, with uh, the, the narrow light beam of the ROVs. It's amazing how hard it can be to find things that you put down. So that's why we tag things with reflective tape and, and little uh, floats. We'll have very accurate GPS location from uh, the crew here, but it, it still can be a challenge to find things in a year. We just had a comment in the science chat from Crispin Little said we had just flown over a thorny head. And apart from the ray, this part of the dive, we haven't seen exactly many fish, which is absolutely true, especially compared to previous dives. That's the end of the transect right there. Beautiful, okay, thank, thank you. you. Would you like me to hold the ship here um, or just keep moving until we find some sediment you like? I think we can keep going. Copy that. Once we see, uh, if we see some reasonable sediment, we might try and poke it, see if we can get a sample. We also got an answer from, I think, Paul's question from earlier about some of the topology of the rocks, some of the circular pits, and Chris Van Little has replied saying those pits are quite common erosion features in basalts. And then Mary Wix Wixton also chimed in saying that those uh, circular features or those, or those burrowing holes that we just saw could be from uh, burrowing lobsters, the biggest of those being a Kaliniopsis gnothalma. And Kira also chiming in to the question about the rocks. It looks like a lot of the types of rocks that we're seeing looks to be mostly broken debris that has fallen down slope. And then these circular depressions in the rocks, again, echoing what Chris from Little has said, um, these circular depressions are likely due to uneven weathering and erosion. There's a lot of pitting just to the left of lasers there. That was a header cone to the left of the, or it was to the left of the lasers. Now it's down. A dead header cone. So does Ozidax left. prefer low oxygen? No. Uh, no, the the bone worms who are interested in getting on the bones are uh, usually bright red because they're full of hemoglobin, blood. Uh, they have a blood pigment similar to ours, and so they're they're aerobic animals. Um, they can tolerate very low oxygen because they have so much blood. Uh, but their bacterial symbionts that live in their roots that they use to dissolve the bone also are aerobic bacteria. So they 
they have a pretty heavy physiological demand for oxygen. Uh, but they are able to tolerate low oxygen, but the biggest ozodacs we ever find are usually in the very deep sea, at 2,000 meters or deeper, where the oxygen levels are usually not too bad. We find small ozodacs in shallower depths uh, of less than 1,000 meters. Okay, um, we've just finished that ship move. We're in this kind of flat bit here, and we're meant to go to point Q, which is a, almost due south. It's a bearing 175. Do we want to head down that direction? Uh, yes, if that's the track, please head that way. Sure. Um, it will get steadily steep and possibly we'll be cross-cutting those contours, but yeah. if it's too steep, we'll then uh, go perpendicular upslope and lateral over. Got it. 175. So is your, is your interest now? in low oxygen to replicate the first deployment? Or we want uh, to... 100 meter step, bearing 175. Thank you. Uh, we've put out these wood stone rocks and bones at a relatively high oxygen level and then we want to just contrast the things that will colonize at a lower level i'm expecting we might get different ozodacs uh, if we can get a few hundred meters depth difference and lisa would like to see what other different kinds of animals might uh, be tolerating a lower oxygen relative to a higher oxygen and we'll do this at two different sites on the cruise So in a few days, we'll put the other pair of sets out. Um, we're s seeing the oxygen decline pretty quickly now. Um, we're just seeing more beautiful ferrea sponges. Otherwise, we've got scattered solus or solidi, the filter feeding sea cucumbers. A bunch of them kind of spotting over those rocks. Yeah. Do they stay in one place, or are they known to move around a lot? They can move a little bit, but really they uh, yeah. are Probably all almost like a sucker. Their whole bottom part of their body becomes very thin, uh, transparent, actually, if you flip them over. But the upper part is quite armored with plates to protect them. They can pull those feathery appendages in if someone comes to attack them because they're very unarmored and, and used for feeding. So they try and get those out of the way if they get disturbed. Science, while we fly, is it OK if we uh, also use this opportunity to uh, see if we can get clear of the hose while we keep on oh, flying? Oh, that's a good idea. Yeah. All right. Someone grab the arm? Please do. Go ahead, Jake. So do they eviscerate like some oliferates? I haven't seen the solids eviscerate. They they don't seem to be able to do that. Uh, they might be able to regenerate though if they were attacked. A lot of sea cucumbers have this amazing ability to lose most of their internal organs, and they can just grow them back. And some are even more specialized with parts of their guts, uh, which they would tend to squeeze out first. Uh, very sticky threads that. Uh, will gum up the mouth of a predator and the moment they hit the seawater they ab absorb the water and become uh, amazingly sticky and if you ever accidentally tread on a sea cucumber in many of the uh, tropical reefs you'll end up with these white long threads all over your nice. legs and they can be pretty hard to get off it's a, an interesting right. natural glue turn on the suction for you I remember a seminar I heard many years ago, and it was called Autotomy and Evisceration in, in Holothroidians. And I was like, what a title for a seminar. And I yeah, learned all about like this out. idea that when they're harassed, they can basically give up some things to the predator in the hopes that they'll go away and sacrifice some of their innards. We don't see it that much strategy. in the deep sea ones. It's mostly the shallow reef ones that you see that, where there's just so many more, much bi greater biomass of fish. Here in the deep sea, the very, apart from the solace, there are these very delicate, uh, very transparent, water-filled uh, uh, sea cucumbers that 
maybe aren't a good meal, so uh, predators don't seem to go near them. You know, interesting when you think about it, though, like uh, sea stars too will give up their arm, right? Or brittle stars. So maybe it's a common kinoderm strategy, this idea of self mutilation. Yeah. Crinoids or feather stars have special, uh, they have, their arms have uh, an internal skeleton and they have breakpoints on their arms that will snap off if someone bites at them, just like a, a pre, uh, an, an easy to break suture that, that allows them to give up the arm without really suffering major damage. Yeah, amazing. And hopefully that's enough to please the predator. And you come back a few weeks later, and there's a little arm growing back out of where it broke off. All right, I think Argus is starting its move uh, southward. Roger. Roger that. Some sea stars are able to Jake just fragment into many five oh, or many so pieces, pieces and each piece yeah. will then grow a new sea star. So they have a asexual reproduction that, really. that involves just fragmenting into their into their various arms, and then you find that arm, and it'll be growing four new arms out of the front the front of the, the original point of the arm where it attached to the body. So it's this thing coming up. Oh, it looks like a Venus flytrap anemone coming up in the field oh, now. That looks super cool. Wow. It's the first one we've seen on, on our watch today. Yeah. We have a question in the science chat from Kristen Little, who's asking, what depth is thought to represent emerg the emergence line for the seamount? Um, that could be important for interpreting the erosive features seen on the rocks here, i.e. submarine versus subaerial weathering. That's a great question, Crispin. And I just got the PDFs recently and haven't scanned through to find that out. Try on link. We'll, we'll get that depth and get back to you. Then we Maybe have a Kira in the uh, in the lounge, can you if you have those PDS could you see or do you know where where uh, San Juan once emerged to? How's the clearing of the slope going? Any progress? Or uh, no? I haven't yeah. seen any cup curl go through. So, yeah. Is that a little red jelly or maybe a tina four? I think it was a tina four. Very cool. Comb jelly. There's a little tiny bit of the yellow that we were looking for. Oh, oh yeah. yeah, fantastic. Jake, keep doing it. You're doing great. It's coming out in fragments. It's perfect. We have another comment in the science chat from Mary Wixton, um, who is asking if we could get a good view of one of those slender red shrimp that would be worthwhile, as this could be the first report of this genus in California, even if it proves impossible to identify any farther. So if we see any more of those, try to get a couple of screen grabs. Okay. Sure thing. We're starting to head up slope again. Looks like the oxygen's leveling off. Should we go there? I think they've got us going here. I don't know. That'll be flat again, maybe. Yeah. We'll just follow the track. Kira has replied in the science chat to our earlier question about the the depth of um the emergence zone for this San Juan Seamount. Here it says that the San Juan Seamount was indeed subaerial for about one million years. Hmm. It reached elevations of 460 feet, um, which would be modern water depth of about 700 meters for the emergent line. So we might well reach that on this dive. We've got a, we're at 950 meters now. So if we can get up another 250 meters, 
Might be stretching to get that close today. We, we are going to add another hour onto the dive today, it looks like. It's going to be some good efforts there, Jake. Yeah. Can you zoom on that thing in the middle? Uh, not sure what that is. Go ahead and start uh, it. The yellow circle? Yeah, what is that? Is it a sponge? Or maybe it's just a big sponge. I'm going to yeah. give you the camera Got there. Um, oh, we don't have our video person there. Fixing a camera okay. issue. Okay, no problem. It looks like a collapsed uh, skeleton of a, s or is it a, is it trash? It looks like a skeleton of a header cone in there. Big, yeah. big skeleton. Yeah. Just yeah. with then a lot of detritus on it, or another yeah. type of sponge on top of it, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. no worries. Keep going. We're getting close to your target of ten micromoles oxygen. A bit too in. Sorry? Is that good there? That's Are great, you on below you. 10? Do you want me to slow I'd like up? to go below 10. No, you're good there. Okay. Thanks, Jake, for trying to get that thing clear. Yep. I think we got one yellow guy. but Fantastic. Yeah, that's great. Maybe there's some other smaller bits we just can't see right now. Yeah. We tend to have tough luck with the cup corals slurping. They tend to get tend to get stuck. That one was pretty small. If anything, it's got it hung up on the yellow thing. Yellow little branching. Which is unfortunate. It was even small enough. Roger that. Uh, I've got Steve looking for Al, and I tried plugging and unplugging the camera, but looks like it didn't come back up, but Steve's on it. So Jessica, did did they tell did they tell you guys we were going to extend the dive for an hour, or did that get word get passed on? Yeah, that word got passed on for us. Yeah. So we'll probably do a, a watch change at four o'clock and then come back on for a chow relief. Try to cover as much ground for you guys as we can. Sediments, you're picking up some red in the sediment here. Wow. There's that shrimp. That yeah, if we, could, if we could get a zoom on, on some of these shrimps to just capture a couple stills. Yeah, definitely. It would be fantastic. Hopefully these are the right, Jonathan, shrimps that Mary Wixton was interested in. Oh, fantastic. Is that the one, Mary? Let us know. A little wide. Decent size. Get the lasers in there, Sean. Just slurp it up. They're, they're not so easy to slurp. <laughs> they're going to try to run. <laughs> no, thanks. They're very, very, very swift. Uh, yeah. These are, wow, it's almost 10 centimeters. Uh, pan to the right. There actually is a the sea urchin just there. We haven't really had a close look at either. Sure thing. Come a little wide there, Jonathan. So that's not a spot prawn, I assume. No. no it's, uh, Pull wide, Jonathan. Suggesties, so I think it is. There it is down there. If you can still get that in the frame, that would be good. Sure thing. This is an echinothuroid sea urchin. They're very venomous, actually. If we get one of these on board, we'll be handling it with care. Hmm. Mary said, yes, that's it. One of them on the left. Yeah. All right, go we ahead. might have captured that shrimp. See, it's got a lot of uh, long tube feet coming out. 
waving in the breeze, and also it has a lot of little spines uh, that can really do some damage. Underneath it has little scoop-like spines that help it walk along. It's a lot of green detritus here. That's probably what it's eating. Okay, thank you. Oh, I... Will it like to scavenge kind of the detritus yeah, off the rocks, yeah. off the sediment? We saw a kelp fall earlier, and there were three of them on a piece of kelp. So. Ooh, zooming. Back to kind of these piles of these, it looks like basalt rocks. It looked like in that flat bit, it wasn't just a slope change, it was, you know, the sheet flow versus these columnar bits. Interesting. Roger that, thank you. Looks like a steeper bit coming up in Argus sonar. Raj. I'll work my way up. And yeah, yeah, visual. <laughs> there it is. Coming up. On those coming smooth up. parts of the rock. Broke 10 micromoles, dropping. look like tuna crabs yeah it is mm -hmm. uh, kind of squat lobster squat lobster um, it's probably not a tuna crab um, which we do see shallower but uh, we have been looking at the genetics of the tuna crabs along the eastern Pacific and trying to pit them into the picture of the they're in their own genus Pleurancodes is the tuna crab and these ones are probably in a genus called Munida, but uh, it looks like it's a bit of a taxonomic mess. So we did sample some Munidas yesterday, by chance, with the rocks. Is that, some some, of the is that a coral there on yeah. that rock? That's from the yellow bryozoan we saw earlier. Snap zoom there, Jonathan. Looks like another Acanthagorgia. I think that's the one we had already. Yeah, there's a couple yeah. little sticks of it over this rock. Did you see the bra zone, Caitlin? Yeah. Oh, that yeah. one. Yeah. Yeah. We were looking Come at on, it. Please. Different one. That zoom is incredible. Uh, it's definitely helped by such clear water. You can see it in the Argus camera up here, just how crisp and beautiful the line of sight is. And what's the depth difference between Argus and Hercules? Uh, it's changing, but it's around 15 to 17 right now. Meters. Meters, meters yes. We call it the delta. Delta depth.
Looks like we might be passing over shrimp sitting on top of the rock. Ah, oh, yeah, to the left. Chris from Little has said there's some nice tubular lavas. Anthogorgia again. Snap zoom here, Jonathan. It's great. Steve is saying that the oh, that's a canthogorgia oh, would hmm. be carpeting at the top of the summit on the southern side. This new mount. That crab looks ready to brawl with us. Yeah. You want to keep coming up there, please? Come up. <coughs> Just if you want, I can go a long contour, and then we could go straight up slope. Might be a little bit better, yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll alter course then. Reg. Okay, we'll shiny. be going uh, 205, and then we'll just jog over. So. 205, right? Bridge snap. That white. Crab on the left. Change course to 205. Sorry, science. We're just trying to get <clears throat> ourselves a bit situated here. Yeah, just the angle of this uh, slope on the way to Q. Instead, we're going to kind of come a long contour if you're looking at high pack for a little yeah. bit and then uh, go straight up slope. Okay. That yeah, might make that things sense. a bit better visually and also for the ROVs. Roger that. You can probably still crab a bit once we uh, once that course has changed. You want me looking two zero five? Uh, stand by. We'll wait for the swing to yeah. go out a little bit. And so what we're looking at here is a, a slope with uh, lots of broken pieces of basalt, which is really lava. You can see there on the left though that's a, a lava tube uh, that would have. Must have been a spectacular sight millions of years ago when that was erupting mm. out of the volcano. And then this is uh, gradually breaking up and fragmenting into the boulders that are then tumbling down the slope. We're seeing quite know. a lot of yeah. uh, yeah. little acanthogorgia corals. So this is more acanthogorgia. mesh like structure you can see there is a dead skeleton of a very large glass all sponge. right jake go ahead and come around to 205 205 i'm going to be looking into dark i think oh. got a few other glass sponges that are bright white that are alive but we're seeing lots and lots of the skeletons of these dead dead sponges so the yellow ones are dead yeah as, as opposed to just being epiphytized. I was wondering about that. Some of the glass sponges will have a coating of sediment or on the outside, but the ones we've been seeing are usually, when they're alive, are bright white. So we're down at 7.5. Yeah, we're seeing a I don't know. rapid drop in oxygen, and uh, quite a lot of corals are starting to show up. So I don't know how much time you want to leave for deployment. Considering it took quite a bit of time. Why, why should we deploy when we can leave it to the others? Oh, is that what you're <laughs> thinking? Oh, okay. I see your strategy. Okay. We, can, we can deploy it if we want. Uh -huh. We'll continue climbing up the seamount. Yep. We'll Beautiful. have the fun. Okay. I'm, I'm okay with that. We would like to get a little higher before we do any any more deploying. But if we need to put things in the bio box, we'll have to put things out.
So we're going laterally along our contour line at a constant depth right now until we get in a better position to start ascending. Then we'll go up again. We're at under 900 meters now, we're at 893 meters. Our goal depth today was about 500 meters, but it's unlikely we'll get that shallow. But we hope to come, still planning tomorrow's dive. Uh, we started late today. We've extended it by an hour, and we're deciding if we'll dive here again tomorrow or potentially move to another site. Kind of going back in time on a little bit of the chat, but I'm curious if any of the structures we're seeing. Um, Crispin Little had speculated that some of these circular structures, kind of the erosion structures that we're seeing, could have been formed by rock boring echinoids when the seamount was much shallower depths. Could that have been possible? Uh, yeah, I'm certainly aware of that phenomenon in, in shallow waters, uh, Crispin. We, we don't have the kind of urchins at this depth that are doing that. Um, and historically, though, we do see them with things like Strongylus centrotus. Here comes another one of those shrimps. 200 meters. Uh, I don't know. It looks like there's a few. Would you like me to zoom on one? Yes, please, if that's possible. We get some yeah, can we slow that. down and we'll have a look at this little uh, There's a couple more shrimps rock. here. Sure thing. So Go ahead and zoom on in there, Jonathan. That's great. We'll just kind of pan over the rock. This is the uh, shrimp that Mary Wixton alerted us to. That could be a new record. Yeah, could we get some stills of this? I think we've been passing over it. more of them. And Mary's yeah. been letting us know. <laughs> not sure if this is called Suggesties or not. Let's All right, a little more zoom there, Jonathan. Beautiful, thank Great. you. Fabulous, wow. Next to the brittle stars. <gasps> Look at those long, whimsical features, mm. appendages. Come on, please. Scavenging on the rock as well. Oh, very cool perspective. not be a bad idea to get another sample of that can canthagorgia. One piece we got was really small and like look at that nice piece right there. Would you like to stop? Yeah, yes, please. We can, Bridge uh, nav. Oh. And what the chances That's are. That's a cool rock. Old position. Very cool biology. We're expecting a little bit of a swing, um, but we can kind of move on. We'll probably see another one in the next. Okay. okay yeah. Next. Uh, yeah. Next decent we sized coral. Just keep our eye open. Yeah. As, as we settle out, we can. Uh, I'm sure we'll find another one. If not, we have a breadcrumb trail of where we just came from. Thanks, Ernie. Mm -hmm. There's a bit here too. It's beautiful. Oh, cool. Nice feature. We'll come back. Hold off here. We'll see how much we're swinging.
looks like you're stating out of it. Yeah. Oh, when I sit on the crumbly thing? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Probably pretty stable here. Roger that. Uh, yeah, let's go for this one up here. It's like an avalanche waiting to happen. So we're going to sample this uh, coral. It's called a canthagorgia. It's an octocoral. They have eight tentacles uh, compared to normal or stony corals that have s multiples of six. And these are... Granny, you want to do me a favor? Corals that don't need light. They just feed on what food comes by in the plankton. They don't have a stony skeleton, they have a skeleton hey, that holds them rigid, made of um, various kinds of proteins. We'll get a nice zoom and we should be able to see the polyps that are out. Trying to catch plankton. You can see them in profile there. The Each little cup has eight tentacles coming out. The surface of the rock is covered with with brittle stars, we can see their arms, their long snake-like arms. Are you full zoom there, Jonathan? You can keep going in if you got. That's full. Raj. All right, Jonathan, full wide. Hey Jonathan, go ahead and push on in there a bit, please. Thank you. A little, little wide. That's great. Let's get a better grip on this. Not taking that at all. Stand by, I'm going to change my group course. Great. Ooh, Perfect. Nice. And we're right. going to be aiming for the starboard bio box. Roger that. The position in between the four bio boxes. Um, but we're going to be aiming for the 
um, position B, which is more towards the aft between the four bio boxes. Sample salvo coming on. Sure thing. Uh, let me change the camera quick. Roger that. Sorry, science, can you repeat where the position will be for this? Absolutely. So we're looking at the starboard bio box. We're going to go for that in-between section, yep. more towards the aft of that bio box. So not in one of the four bio boxes, but that aft in-between section. Got you. Thank you. Roger. So basically where we put the other, other samples before? Exactly. Yes. Those sponges and that other exact one like this. Sure thing. So we're going to give this a new sample number. Go ahead, Jake. Yes, and that Bump new sample number is going to be NA124045. Roger that. Are you going to be able to tell this one in the alone part? Yeah. This one, I think, a little bit larger. Copy. Looks like it's balanced on the box there. Ah. So close. Do you want to put stuff out? You want to just wait? You don't want to put out here? Put anything out here? Mind trying to slurp some sediment. So it's dangling off my fingers there. So close. It's gonna open here. Hmm, let's do something different here. It looks like it's going to go in that way, right? Correct? Yes. Yeah. I think that's correct. There we go, it went. That went in. Perfect. Nice. It's sinking down. Awesome. Expert skills, thank you. Sure thing. You can change over salvos there, Jake. Thank you. Do we think the slurp is um, working, or we should we'd have to test and see if it's okay? Um, for sediment, it might be all right, but yeah, I think there's still things in the hose that haven't come out yet. Okay. Yeah. Um, is there a sediment sample here that you're interested in? Uh, we can continue. We'll, we